Uh, thanks for uh, having me here today. Uh, I'm going to talk about x-rays, which uh, probably is not what uh, the organizers thought I would talk about when they, they invited me, but I appreciate, uh, appreciate the invitation anyway. So uh, this, this is uh, some work that we've been working on for a couple years, but this is actually uh, one of the first uh, public talks where we've uh, uh, described uh, what we're doing. Um, just an outline on uh, what I want to talk about. I'm actually going to uh, review, for, for some of you that may not have seen it before, some of the background on uh, a compressive topography uh, that we, we've been working on for uh, around 10 years or so, and talk about how that led us uh, to x-rays. Um, x-rays are a, a, an example of uh, radiance tomography in, in the way we talk about it, and so I want to I talk about some background on uh, radiance tomography. Um, and then uh, finally, in the third part, I'll get to why we're imaging x-rays. I mean, I, I'm noticing that this is a meeting on Next generation medical imaging, I can't help but notice that I seem to be the only person talking about x-rays, uh, which is, you know, um, obviously an important medical imaging technology. Uh, you might think it's mature. Uh, I'm finding it's extremely immature, that there's, there's just enormous opportunities, it turns out, uh, in, in x-rays. Um, and then, so I, then finally I'll tell you about some experiments we did, uh, published earlier this year in Optics Express on... Uh, uh, coded aperture uh, X-ray scatter imaging, and, and why we did that, and then uh, some continuing work we're doing to expand that to uh, a more rapid uh, X-ray tomography. Um, I started working on, on radiance tomography actually quite a while ago in, in a conceptual way. This is this is some work from 2004 on something we called uh, reference structure tomography. Um, we never did. Um, I mean, we, we did experiments in the optical regime with this. It's an obvious thing to do for x-rays, but uh, we, we never worked on x-rays until this last year, uh, mostly because uh, we, we just had the opportunity, uh, thanks to uh, uh, some funding from the Department of Homeland Security, to really start a, a major x-ray effort uh, recently. Uh, the original idea with reference structure tomography and, and sort of the compelling interest that I have is... Uh, when you build an imaging system, any kind of measurement system, you have choices in the physical hardware. Um, and you have, you know, field that you send out, illuminate a sample, you have a field that comes back through the aperture. Uh, you'd like some confidence that you chose the best measurements. Did you, did you build the physical system that made the right measurements to get as much information about the object as, as you could? And we treated that in a fairly abstract way. Um, uh, you know, in 2004, uh, where we said, well, we'll allow ourselves to say that the field is just rays, it propagates in, in radiance, and then we can modulate the field by putting objects in the rays, by obscuring it with arbitrary 3D structures. And so th this was an example of that, uh, where, you know, these are all rays that go through a volume, we have detectors on a, surf on a circle that surrounds the object, and these obscurants that could go between the object and the, uh, um, and the detectors. And we said, well, what would be the best obscurance to put in that would code the visibility um, in ways that uh, um, we, we could invert. And the one thing we discovered right away was that um, the number of different object signature cells, the number of points in the object, the regions that have the same coding on the detectors, uh, grows much faster than the number of obscurance, grows faster than the complexity of the optics, basically, and the complexity of the detectors. Um, and what that meant was that uh, this is a uh, fundamentally ill-conditioned problem. But we found that that didn't really matter if we made this complex enough. And this, this was an example of we had some simple object like this that we could project on a wavelet basis. But if we, we, the object is uh, 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 64 by 64 in, in size, so you know, 64 squared cells, that we reconstructed with just 64 measurements using a, a just kind of least squares estimator. And so this was for us a start of thinking about uh, compressive tomography. Uh, we did some simple experiments with that back then where we built actually three-dimensional reference structures and we showed that we could get patterns for, we actually pointed this out the window and we could track cars driving by by looking at the kind of complex patterns that, that they formed on the, on the sensor. And this was a, you know, a, a silly little experiment to do, but actually a, a fairly important change in the way we thought about uh, measurement systems. Because we work a lot on compressive measurement and I'll tell you the definition of compressive measurement is uh, you're going to estimate n object parameters from m measurements, where m, the number of measurements, is less than the number of object parameters that you want to estimate. Okay. Now, the definition of tomography is that you're going to estimate an object in you know, d dimensions from d, from measurements distributed over d dimensions, where the measurement me dimension is lower than the 
object dimension. And usually you balance that with time and there's concepts of conservation of dimensionality. What happens when you get to these kind of generalized sensors is that you, you've broken that order. There isn't really a natural dimension for the measurement data. That objects exist, objects have dimensionality in two senses. They have dimensionality in the sense of the number of <laughs> pixels you estimate and they have dimensionality in terms of what is their embedding dimension, which is an order for the pieces in the object. The pixels are ordered in some way and that's why images are, are compressible. Measurement data doesn't have to have an order. And when you go to this kind of, I'm going to apply arbitrary codes, there's no sense in which there's a natural space in which the measurements exist. And once you say the measurements don't have an order, you have to, you no longer are convinced that dimensionality should be conserved in tomographic systems. That you don't have a dimensionality in the measurements, so why should the dimensionality of the measurements be in any way similar to the dimensionality of the reconstruction? And then you get to the idea of compressive measurement. So this uh, tomography and compressive measurement turn out to be kind of uh, integrally linked. And I think that's one of the reasons why I think some of the, the more compelling demonstrations of compressive measurement are all in tomography. I think these, these are all examples where there is no other way to make these measurements and it, it turns out to be just a compelling and, and, and exact way to say this was a good idea. Um, one of the examples that we've had some success with in compressive, so ba basically now let me give you some more background on tomography. Um, there, there are four major classes of uh, tomography and, and maybe uh, five if we're, we're going to be kind of generous. Uh, the, the, the four or five majors, maybe six, I can keep thinking of more. Um, <laughs> The three that I'm interested in have to do with radiation fields. The, 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 the three interesting ones for radiation fields are uh, fields that are coherent fields, fields that are modeled by radiance functions, propagating rays, and fields that are modeled by coherence functions. So those are the three model, major classes for, um, uh, for radiation fields. Uh, the other classes are uh, non-propagating tomographies, but like MRI is an example, and it's a, it's a good example, all kinds of compressive nice things done there. There's some talks on it here. I don't happen to be interested in it. Um, the uh, um, other examples are tomographies of multi-dimensions, like uh, hyperspectral imaging and, uh, and video are examples of multi-dimensional tomographies. And then a, a final example might be a diffusion tomography, which is another example of a, of, a, of a field propagation. Of the three radiation propagating fields, we've done nice demonstrations of the value of compressive measurement, and, these are, and also in the one of multi-dimensional tomography. Uh, these two here are demonstrations of uh, diffraction tomography. Uh, this is some work we did with uh, 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 compressive flography uh, where we showed that we could uh, measure a single snapshot Gabor hologram very similar to, to the kinds of holograms that uh, 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 Professor Oskan just, just showed and showed we could take a single two-dimensional measurement and, and re reconstruct uh, true three-dimensional tomographic data by applying constraints on the back propagation in, into the full image volume. Uh, we've repeated that work uh, here with, uh, th that was at uh, visible wavelengths. These are uh, different planes in Z. This is kind of what the hologram looked like, but the non-propagating part of the hologram gets confined to the Z equals zero plane. And then these were some dandelion seeds that we reconstructed at different Z planes independently. Uh, we repeated that at millimeter wave uh, uh, frequencies here uh, with some different plastic objects at, at different ranges. Uh, this is an example of some work for uh, uh, coded aperture uh, spectral imaging, uh, we, we repeated this work for uh, uh, hyperspectral images showing that we could reconstruct a, a three-dimensional hyperspectral image from a single two-dimensional uh, measurement plane. Uh, this one is most related to what we're doing with x-rays. All of these are related in some sense in the, in the sense that when we do the, tom tomography is slice selection. When we measure, make a two-dimensional measurement of a three-dimensional object, we've kind of mixed all the slices together. To back them back out from compressive measurement, what we want is all the planes, all the different planes to be on an independent code. I'm not going to explain how we do that with diffraction tomography, although that would actually be the most interesting thing for the ultrasound community because ultrasound is an example of uh, diffraction tomography. But um, for the hyperspectral imaging, basically we were able to use coded apertures to modulate each of the spectral planes with an independent code that we can then analyze and find each of the spectral planes independently and reconstruct them uh, back out. Okay, so that's some background on compressive tomography. Uh, when we think about how to move forward with these systems, um, basically to do compressive tomography, you, you know, you, you need uh, two things. You need, you need the physical system that encodes the measurements and, and uh, collects them in some intelligent way. You need to choose your measurements in a nice way. And then you need an inversion algorithm that will 
you know, not, not asimilar to the kinds of algorithms that Adrian just talked about, that uh, inverts and gives you a best estimate of, uh, of, of, of your scene. Um, I don't really work that much on the inversion algorithms because I have lots of friends that, that do a good job uh, with that. Uh, most of what I think about is the physical system. How, how do we implement uh, codes that will contain, you know, resolution and features that I'm most interested in these systems? And so what, we, what my lab mostly does is we look at a system and say, uh, here's the features that we're kind of interested in. Here's the kinds of measurements we could make. How do we jumble those together so that we can show that we have sensitivity in the principal components of our measurement system that are most related to the features that we're interested in? And when we do that, we're constrained by physics. We have to say, well, what are the things we can change? Usually we can you know, change the illumination. We can play with the spectrum. We can modulate you know, the visibility with optical elements. We can change the pixel size on the detectors. If we want to do digital super resolution, we can change the, pixels, the detector super spectral response. But we go in and make a list of this and then just go try to change all of them to get the kind of sensitivity we want. Um, the thing that we've been focused on in the last uh, couple years uh, in, in, is, is really applying this to uh, radiance imaging, uh, which is x-rays. So the, again, the, these are all models of measuring the same thing, the electromagnetic field, but just based on the frequency and resolution that you're interested in, you choose a different model for the field. With x-rays, we choose to work in, the, in terms of the radiance, which is the intensity of the field at a point in space and the momentum of the field uh, propagating in space. So on a, on a surface, the radiance is going to be a four-dimensional function. Um, the, uh, um, all X-ray systems, mostly, you know, at least reasonable CT systems, basically are radiance sensors. Uh, the, you can think of the general problem that you have in designing X-ray systems is that you don't have radiance cameras. You know, the, what, you, what you measure is the intensity to point. You can't measure the direction of propagation of the X-rays. So you choose a clever way to figure out how to constrain that so, so that you can get the, the radiance in, in some simple way in designing a tomographic system. This, of course, is very similar to the hyperspectral imaging problem. That In the hyperspectral imaging problem, we, we work with detectors that are insensitive to color, but we can code the color planes independently so that we can make a color insensitive detector sensitive to a wide range of colors. In fact, the, the problems are actually kind of identical, which is what led us here as we went to Department of Homeland Security and said we make these visible hyperspectral imagers. They're the same as X-ray hyperspectral cameras, but in the case of X-rays, what you're interested in is the radiance and not really the color. Um, in conventional CT systems, this problem, how do you get the radiance, is, is uh, controlled by either controlling the illumination. For example, if you have a, a, a point target illuminating the object, then there, there is only one possible ray to each detector element, and so you only have to measure the intensity because you've constrained the radiance not to, not to fully sample the range of radiance. And so, and then, but what you have to do then is move that detector as a function of time, and so you get a sequence of slices that allow you to reconstruct uh, the full radiance function over a function of time. Alternatively, people have used uh, coded apertures previously um, in X-ray systems uh, under an assumption that all points in the object radi radiate in all directions, and that's conventional coded aperture imaging, uh, where, you, you know, in this case, effectively what you're saying is at the plane of the coded aperture, you don't care what the intensity is at local points, you only care about the direction of propagation of the rays, and what the coded aperture does by allowing, you can imagine the coded aperture in the simplest case being a pinhole, by putting a pinhole and then looking at the, the rays that go through the pinhole, you've captured the, the direction of propagation, but not the radiance over the two-dimensional plane. Putting a coded aperture in allows you to get, to collect the rays over a two-dimensional plane, but works essentially the same as a pinhole. Um, so in each case, you've taken the four-dimensional radiance function and constrained it to be effectively a two-dimensional radiance function. Um, before we started doing experiments back in, in 2009, uh, Krukel Choi and I published a, a paper in, in SPIE that talked about the similarity between what we were doing with uh, coded aperture spectral imaging and coded aperture X-ray tomography. Um, and the basic idea at that time was that if we put you know, if you had a source array simultaneously illuminating the object, we could put a coded aperture between the sources and the object, and then each source would be propagating in a different direction. There'd be some dispersion. Effectively, we'd have a different code on each source that we could then back out. So rather than doing tomography by illuminating by some sequence of sources, we could simultaneously illuminate with all the sources and separate them back out mathematically and do uh, decompressive tomography. And in fact, we are, we are working on versions of this uh, even as we speak, but I'm going to talk about a simpler version of, uh, of compressive uh, X-ray imaging today. Um, I want to 
back up just a, just a minute and talk about, again, you know, what I think about when we design these systems is how do we compare the different physical choices? We have you know, infinitely different choices we could make in making a measurement. How do we say which one is better than the other and how do we do uh, design? And so what we're trying to do in, the, in these systems is basically uh, to maximize the number of singular vectors, maximize the conditioning of the forward model, and maximize the overlap of the modes that we measure, the singular vectors, with features of, of the object. And I want to give you just a simple example of how we do that uh, for a radiance camera. In the, in the, in, you know, our, our choices are you know, controlling the source uh, coming to, that's illuminating the object, putting optical elements between the source and the object, and optical elements after the source and, and before the detector array. Um, a particular simple example would be uh, just, just confine ourselves to the plane and say that the radiance consists of uh, intensity along a line and then rays propagating at some angle theta relative to that line. And I could measure, um, you know, I could measure intensity on some detector uh, a distance away from the line, which is going to integrate uh, over the rays of prop direction of propagation of the radiance and just give me uh, an intensity. And I could move that detector as a function of z, which is a basically uh, uh, phase, is a version of phase diversity imaging. If I move it as a function of z, I could get the, 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 the full radiance function. I basically, I'm getting a radon transform in that case. If I move it as a function of z, I'm making a three-dimensional tra transformation. I'm getting a radon transform of the radiance function. Um, if I put a coded aperture in, and instead of moving this function of z, I could choose to move the coded aperture laterally, um, I, I'm getting a different kind of uh, uh, transform. And one of the things that we've uh, discovered, this is kind of interesting, is that actually using coded apertures, we can localize the kernel in, in space in a way that gives us better uh, conditioning and actual radiance function or radon transforms uh, imaging. So one of the compelling reasons ultimately that we get excited about coded aperture X-ray imaging is actually it turns out to be better conditioned for tomography than, than radon transform imaging. And a simple example of that is, is shown here. Um, if I do this uh, radon approach to measuring the measurement, the, the, the radiance here, as I move in, in Z, I'm measuring a function of, of, of projections through this two-dimensional radiance space that rotate. So it's giving me the conventional radon transforms. On the other hand, if I have the coded aperture, I'm taking each one of those ray projections through the radiance space and modulating them by the coded aperture. And then what, what happens if I move the coded aperture, each one of these rays is still measured, weighted by the coded aperture. The kernel is local, that I only measure along that ray. So I'm no longer, I'm no longer integrating over the full volume. And that's going to give me, um, basically, in, in both cases, the uh, singular value decomposition is going to go one over the square root of the number of points I'm imaging in any part of the kernel. But because one has a, a local kernel, it's going to be um, you know, orders of magnitude better condition uh, than something that has a kernel over the full, full space. Um, and so that's, that's the kinds of things we think about. And then the next step for us then is, so what, we're interested in specific features. For example, what if I told you that the object is going to emit its sharp angles um, over some, you know, maybe it'll be kind of smooth in space and sharp in angle. Um, if I code in, the, radi in, the, in the, ra the radon case, I get kind of a smooth featureless features, where if I code in the coded aperture space, I could get, you know, some high frequency modulation. And that's then what's going to be a guiding principle for us in putting the system together. One may be better for one situation or another based on what I think my priors are uh, for the structure of the object. Um, so all of that is to say that this is kind of a toy problem that gives you an idea of how you think about the coding. Um, the actual problems that we're spending a lot of time working on these days is improving x-ray systems. And um, ultimately, you know, we, we have demonstrated now, I think, some, some you know, major improvements to x-ray systems in the sense that, uh, you know, Eidergan's talking about, you know, cell phone based, uh, you know, diagnostic instruments. Uh, we, we believe that we, we can make x-ray instruments that will be, uh, you know, low exposure, uh, clinical instruments that rather than, you know, doing CT with large rotating gantries, you can have a, you know, an arm CT that you would just hold your arm up to and in a single snapshot it'll, it'll capture full CT data uh, across uh, local points. But, and, and I think that is important and cool, but the thing that really motivated us to get into this is we wanted to make x-rays uh, something that is not just a structural imaging system, but something that's a molecular uh, imaging system. And it, it turns out that there are uh, molecular signatures in, in x-ray scatter that we can use to identify specific materials. Uh, this one is the one that uh, the Department of Homeland Security is interested in. This is the molecular um, uh, scatter spectrum for uh, uh, TNT. Um, this is based on uh, coherent scatter. 
uh, it's basically uh, uh, nanocrystalline effects, na nanocrystalline coherence in the material. Uh, if you have uh, uh, this kind of nanocrystalline structure, uh, you're going to see uh, uh, coherent inter interference on the nanometer scale and scattering from the object that gives you a uh, coherent scatter structure in, in, this, in either the spectrum or the uh, momentum transfer uh, as X-rays uh, scatter. Now, um, not, not, you know, you, this is not going to work as well for liquids. It's, you, need, you need materials that, that uh, have oxide structure or other kinds of interesting structure, but it turns out to be true for, for you know, lots of classes of, of interesting materials that, that we can see uh, these kind of uh, uh, coherent scatter structure. And then there's also, of course, uh, X-ray fluorescence and other molecular-specific uh, signatures that we can look for uh, as we try to do uh, molecular X-ray imaging. Um, so to uh, image this uh, coherent scatter, basically uh, what we're trying to do is the same thing as what you would do with X-ray diffractometry, uh, but with X-ray diffractometry conventionally you have a small sample, you put it in an X-rays and you look at the scatter spectrum. We're doing X-ray tomo diffractometry tomographic imaging, so we're trying to get the molecular scatter signal at every, every point uh, in a volume. Um, and it turned out that we were able to show that we could do this um, in a well-conditioned way in, in a single snapshot uh, with, with a pencil beam if we put a coded aperture uh, between the uh, uh, pencil beam and the detector. Um, now, this turns out to be different from conventional coded aperture imaging uh, because what, what happens is you, you get a scatter spectrum from each point in the volume and what each point along, the, along this volume emits some you know, cone of rays and the difference between different range points is that they'll see different magnification on the detector. If I, if I, if I scatter at some fixed angle from this volume, it scatters out to some large ring. If I scatter at the same angle here, it scatters out to a smaller ring. So the difference in different range points uh, is, um, is differences in magnification. Uh, so uh, we had to come up with a, with a new kind of uh, way of thinking about coded apertures. Uh, traditionally, coded apertures are, are used in, in two situations, um, primarily. Uh, one is what I showed you before, where you're doing, you're placing a, a pinhole with a coded aperture. What you want is a coded aperture that is uh, 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 orthogonal on translation, so that you can tell if the, if the image has been uh, shifted. And so people use these Golay codes that are, that are orthogonal on translation. Uh, the alternative is, uh, coded aperture has been used a lot in uh, spectroscopy, which is not a... Uh, uh, a spatially ordered imaging system, and, and, and there you want coded apertures that are um, well conditioned for inversion but are, are not really spatially uh, related. Uh, here uh, we want a coded aperture that's orthogonal on, trans on, on magnification instead of orthogonal on, on uh, translation. And it turns out functions that are orthogonal on magnification are, are sines and cosines. Harmonic functions are orthogonal on, uh, on magnification, so we chose to use a harmonic coded aperture here. Um, I won't get into the details, but basically we do maximum likelihood estimators to uh, take our measured coded data and reconstruct the, uh, the, the full uh, 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 tomographic image along, along a pencil beam. Uh, this is what an experiment looks like. Uh, you know, we, we have an x-ray source uh, back here. Uh, here's the collimator. Uh, here's the object's going to go along the, the, the path of the, of, of the pencil beam. And here's what our coded aperture looks like. In this case, you know, x-rays in spite, you're working at very small wavelengths, typically you're interested in resolutions that are on the millimeter or centimeter scale, and so our, our coded apertures are actually just milled out of lead in this case. Uh, we've uh, lately been making smaller coded apertures where we use 3D printers and fill them up with um, tungsten powder to create coded apertures. Um, but this is uh, what a single snapshot reconstruction looks like for uh, uh, paths along a pencil beam. So this is pencil beam as a function of Z in centimeters. We put aluminum at one range and salt at, at another range. And so you're seeing the density integrated for the full spectrum of the aluminum and the salt. And then at each one of the, if you reach in here and click on, on this, we can reconstruct the full scatter spectrum of the, uh, of, the, of the salt at one range and the aluminum at another range. And so you can identify uh, that they are what they are. And then this, these are results uh, from this paper in Optics Express earlier this year on, on pencil beam uh, coded aperture systems. Um, more recently, we, you know, we've been spending a lot of time uh, working on uh, compressive uh, versions of this and going up to, uh, I mean, th this system, you can, you're, you're getting a full reconstruction along the pencil beam, but then you'd have to raster scan the pencil beam to do a full uh, three-dimensional reconstruction. Uh, we've more, more recently been focusing a lot on uh, fan beam systems where we uh, illuminate with, with a fan beam system, measure the scatter out of the plane, um, 
and, and reconstruct the fan beam, which then becomes uh, two-dimensional measurements to reconstruct a three-dimensional uh, space and, and spectral uh, volume. So that's a, a decompressive uh, reconstruction system. Uh, that one, um, you know, then becomes, uh, uh, both of these are interesting in the sense that uh, in contrast with conventional X-ray tomography where um, you have to make a bunch of measurements and then process them to reconstruct the volume, these measurements reconstruct the volume that you illuminated in a single snapshot. So that, you, you know, the, the part that you illuminated, you're done as soon as you never illuminate it again. Um, and that's obviously, you know, going to be very important to the way you think about how X-rays should be applied and allows you to create X-rays without rotating uh, anything and, and without, uh, um, uh, you know, illuminating at, with high intensity over, over a number of exposures. Uh, so in the case of the uh, uh, fan beam, you know, we, we're going to have a two-dimensional uh, object in X and Y, and then, uh, um, and then third dimension is, is the scatter angle, and that translates into this... Uh, uh, you know, four-dimensional uh, radiance function coming out, and we're trying to use the uh, coded aperture to uh, estimate that, that radiance. Um, the, the, the results I'm going to show here are, are simulations. We'll, we'll have a paper coming out on uh, actual experimental data from the fan beam uh, probably in, in, in a month or so, but uh, actually Dep Department of Homeland Security is sensitive about us telling you too much too fast, so I'm going to show you sim simulations right now. Um, but um, so in this case, we used a pseudo-random code uh, rather than the, because we were, we're interested in uh, not just you know a scale uh, reproduction. We have to now get cross range in the fan beam uh, as well. Um, these are um, you know an example of where we have uh, uh, objects at two different positions in transverse position and then, and then different points in, in range. Um, and then this is what the measured data would look like in this case with not the pseudo-random code but with the periodic code. Uh, but these are what, uh, you know, reconstructions then look like is, uh, you, again, you reconstruct the spectrum independently for the two objects uh, and, and reconstruct their spatial position independently as well. Uh, this is, these are for two pieces of aluminum. This is two pieces of, of graphite, um, the difference being that you have this, you know, different spectrum. The nice thing that you see here is these, these uh, coherent scatter spectra tend to be uh, sparse. They tend to be spiky, which allows us to do this uh, decompressive inference. Um, and, of course, our objects are kind of pretty sparse and, and smooth here as well. Uh, here's reconstructions of a variety of different objects in the same scene with salt and aluminum at different points in space, and then in the spectrum, again, uh, independently uh, reconstructed. Uh, so um, what, I, you know, what I hope I've shown you is that uh, uh, this idea of compressive tomography um, applies basically to uh, any kind of tomography. That it, once you decide what kind of codes you want to implement, um, you, you, you can basically, the world is your oyster. There's no measurement system. You, you can't go uh, and improve. Uh, we're um, very excited about uh, applications of this to, to x-rays. And I, I think as we've dug deeper into this, you know, of course, you start off thinking, I don't know anything about x-rays. How are we going to do anything about this? And then, of course, this term, I, I know everything about x-rays because I'm teaching a class in x-rays, so I have to act like I know uh, what, what we're talking about. But as we've dug deeper in it, it's just gotten richer and richer and richer. Um, uh, we're working here with a kind of simple uh, detector model for the x-rays um, and then using, uh, uh, you know, we, we've been using mostly uh, uh, radiographic uh, uh, photodiode arrays uh, from, uh, from uh, medical CT systems. Uh, we're increasingly interested in doing digital you know, pixel super resolution. Uh, there are nice x-ray spectral detectors so that we, we can combine um, uh, energy resolving detectors in the case of x-rays with the radiance resolving detectors and that will allow us to continue to improve our, our, our sensor efficiency. Uh, we're looking at combining this with the stuff I talked about earlier where we would do uh, uh, coded multi-source illumination with x-rays. I think a, 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 the current main uh, frontier in uh, compressive tomography uh, focuses on uh, adaptive measurement where uh, you illuminate, make some measurements, and then uh, update your illumination strategy based on your current estimate of the object. And that yields uh, much, much higher compression ratios than what we get with this kind of uh, uh, static or, or fixed coding. And so it's an area that uh, uh, just has uh, room for uh, uh, a lot of research, I think, for, for years to come. So uh, thanks very much. Thanks. <laughs> Questions and discussion? Come on, man. Uh, I, so I will start with a question. So um, since this is different groups 
thinking about different technologies overlapping. I'm, I'm going to ask two questions, both ignorant, well, showing my ignorance, but I'm trying to make a connection. One, when you're in these uh, early experiments where you're testing some of these ideas, it seems to me you're dealing with these sparsely filled space, you know, the aluminum, et cetera. But, uh, ultimately, one will deal with larger objects in which there's structure internally. And then you're going to have x-ray uh, absorption and emission scattering, let's say, as a function of a, a macroscopic object with structure inside and coming from the, along the line, as you said, and then detection. In some sense, my way of optics way of thinking it is that wherever the scattering is occurring, it then has to pass through the medium and there's some sort of apodization, essentially, through that medium, and then a series of, as you move along Z. Is there any way to think of that, that, that there's information there, essentially, or is that uh, trivial and it's, it's redundant with what you're doing? If you see what I mean. Yeah, so um, let me answer that, and then I can yeah. go to your second question. Um, uh, so, that, I mean, that's a common problem with, with x-rays in, in, in any kind of uh, volume imaging system right. uh, is, is that you have uh, to deal with the modulation of the beam by, right. by the object. Um, and, and, and so, um, uh, to first order, of course, you just ignore it and say, I'm going to assume a born approximation. Everything just scatters once and it's right. done. Uh, then the second order thing to do would be some kind of uh, a recursive fitting uh, to the object and estimating the, the scatter. Um, certainly, uh, for scatter imaging, we start with the assumption that stuff only gets scattered once, and, and if it gets uh, scattered twice, that's as far as artifacts for us. Um, if, if we're, it, it's, an, it's an interesting, I think, a long-term problem that, that if you're doing kind of a global uh, system, um, and it, like we're doing the fan beam, and we're only illuminating the fan, and the scattering happening outside of the fan, that's hard for us to account for. But if we if we scan the fan right. so that we build an, ob an image of the object, then we could build a recursive algorithm right. that, that would start to model the scattering and, and try to get information out of it, or at least try to remove the artifacts that it causes. Right, and especially if you go in with some information about the approximate internal constituents, let's say it's a body or something that you know yes. something about approximately going in, that might start, you could have us. I think this is where adaptation is really going to come into play too, right. because then the other thing you could do is once you get an estimate of the object, you can yeah. say, well, what illumination could I give, right. give that would minimize those kind of artifacts? Right, 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 right. And you'd go back and re-illuminate to try to get rid of them. Right. Now my second question uh, will have to do with correspondence or lack thereof, especially in your classification system of these different types of tomographies between x-rays, which you're studying now, and ultrasound, which we heard about this, this morning. Right, so well, ultrasound is, is uh, generally it's a coherent way. So right. it's, it's an example of uh, uh, diffraction tomography. So it's equivalent basically to our work in the holography and, uh, um, and, and work with millimeter waves and, right. and, and radar. I think that that whole class of uh, systems, that, you know, there's just a lot of people doing interesting work on that. And the, the main issue with that type of tomography, by the way, uh, is that uh, um, each, each, what's cool is each one of these, you know, it's all starting with propagating waves, but they, you end up with what are the main challenges. And in diffraction tomography, in one sense, it's beautiful because you, you naturally tend to measure in a Fourier space, which is a global sample of your object and it's kind of well conditioned for uh, compressive measurement. Right. Uh, but the, the, the killer of all uh, coherent tomography or coherent tomographies or diffraction tomography is that objects aren't really sparse because they tend to have speckle. Right. And that the, the speckle field is, is not sparse. Uh, so uh, our, our solution to that has been to uh, uh, build a model that does incoherent imaging with coherent fields. So that you, you know, so we, we have a couple of papers on this idea of uh, what we call a, a diffuse holography, where, where we uh, um, build a, a forward model uh, that, uh, that uh, tries to estimate the underlying scattering intensity from coherent measurements. And actually, we have a paper that's just about finished on that. that uh, one, of the, one of the ways you think about that is compressive measurement on what nominally is non-compressive data. Mm -hmm. Because uh, essentially, the way people mm -hmm. tend to deal with speckle is to try to average it out and right. take some block and, and average. Uh, another way to think about it is that if you measure an image that has speckle in it, it's not as many measurements as you think it is. That you, and that's what, that's what averaging is doing. But you shouldn't right. average based on kind of a, just a local average, you should average on some kind of compressive kernels. Right. And that gives us some very nice results, actually, for uh, uh, smarter averaging. For despeckling, yeah. basically, of, of data. Um, but an equivalent way to think about it would be build a model that is aware that you're, that you're trying to estimate statistics of the object and that the image is not the, the raw image that you measure. But 
the, the take home message for that is that there's huge opportunities in diffraction tomography, but the main issue is speckle, not these other things. Thank you. More, yes. Yeah. Uh, and then there are three, I mean, what's the Speak up so we can hear you. Yeah, what's the ultimate biomedical application that this tree could be used in uh, to image the volume or characterize the issue? Um, take that subject. And what's the best, what's the solution uh, this modality? Um, well, first of all, I should say this is very new work, so um, we're, we're not, and, and, and I'm, I'm not paid to think about biomedical applications, um, so, so uh, um, uh, we, we are working with, uh, um, we work with Martin Tornai, who's in radiology at Duke, and, and he's interested in, uh, in, in breast tissue scanning, so I, I mean, certainly I think that uh, uh, that will be, and, but basically I, I think that this work is going to impact all x-ray tomography. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a generalization of x-ray tomography that at the very least you, you can augment conventional uh, uh, photoelectric tomography with, the, with these new methods. Um, the uh, um, near-term applications I think are going to be smaller scale, lower cost uh, uh, tomographic systems. Although, you know, in the, in the very near term, this is more likely to impact biomedical research than diagnostics because I, I think that uh, this reference structure approach is also a nice, very nice way for us to do uh, x-ray microscopes where we, we, we'll be able to, rather than using a synchrotron, to study crystal structure of proteins. Uh, we'll, I think we can make microscopes that can study them on very low-cost lab instruments. Um, so um, the, the answer is sort of everything, and I don't really know. More questions. So um, a lot of what you seem to talk about, like it uh, applied very well to situations where you're looking at the scattered data. Uh, is there any sense in which these coded apertures could be useful in a purely transmissive uh, mode? Uh, yeah. The, 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 in fact, that was our the original approach I was talking about, where we're coding the sources. That uh, we we we, we uh, um, rather than illuminate sequentially. So basically, any measurement system where you're measuring sequential pixels, or where you're measuring, where you're controlling anything that happens in sort of a spatially sequential local way, has got to be a mistake. Because, you know, <laughs> like, like if you're measuring an image and you measure this pixel and then you measure the pixel next to it, that's the most correlated data. That's, that's not as efficient as you could be information theoretically. That you need to measure here, and then what would be the next most uncorrelated measurement to go to? That, that would be the way to maximize your information transfer. And so you know the tomographic systems can't be right because if you're, if you're scanning kind of sequentially, you're not uh, collecting data efficiently. Now it's not easy with a rotating gantry to sort of you know, look from here and then look from over here, but people are now making all kinds of source arrays where you could turn on a source over here and then a source over here. Um, so what we're working on, for example, is uh, uh, adaptive control of source arrays in a way that would maximize the, the efficiency. And so, yeah, one, one of the applications of this will be to uh, uh, drastically lower the exposure and improve the efficiency of conventional projection tomography. Okay. Any more questions? If not, let's thank.